Intermountain wandering garters get their name from their tendency to migrate, in some instances several miles, to summer foraging grounds. They can be found at all elevations in Montana, although the record is 9,071 feet in the Beartooth. Irrespective of their rambling nature, this species tends to stay near water sources and migrate during rainy periods. I encountered 23 wandering garters during my surveys in 2013. They dominated the northern floodplain, and even at the clubhouse, they outnumber common garter sightings 3 to 1. Moreover, I did not encounter any other snake species at Davis Creek. Why did the wandering garter appear so often in 2013? In 2011 and 2012, I encountered wandering garters starting in July, when the summer heat started to pick up. May of 2013 stayed unseasonably warm. Western toads started breeding by mid-May. Perhaps like the toads, the wandering garters reacted to these favorable climatic conditions earlier on in the season. The success of any ectotherm depends on the climatic events of a given year. I want to briefly focus on pattern variability for this species. In the literature, patterns tend to be defined by geographic region, but there are a remarkable number of variants at MPG Ranch, especially in the northern floodplain. The markings on this 17-inch specimen typify drawings and pictures featured in field guides. Notice the definitive longitudinal stripes. Black spots overlap the median yellow stripe. I caught this specimen minutes after the snake shown previously. Variability is immediately evident. The yellow longitudinal stripes remain indistinct. The brown background color features mottled black and white spots, which help to further break up the snake's pattern. Notice that the median line becomes broken up by dark blotches down the length of the body. The wandering garter in this case has literally lost his stripes. The black spots help visually break up the snake's form when fleeing, making it wavy and difficult to discern. I found this juvenile actively foraging for baby toads at Toad Pond. Notice that this specimen demonstrates increasing variability. The median stripe breaks up almost immediately. Dark blotches are prominent. There is no gray background between the longitudinal stripes. Instead, black blotches and flecks of white present an atypical model pattern when one looks at the snake from above. William dove into Toad Pond and caught this snake underwater. An impressive feat for a six-year-old. So you to put him on the log where you found him? This snake also lacks the definitive longitudinal stripes. Black blotches are prominent. However, brown dominates the sides, medium stripe, and ventral scales of this snake. I included this macro shot of William's specimen to show the color patterns rely on the proximity of scales. Individual scales do not independently define a color pattern. This snake's longitudinal stripes are tan. A dark gray background and black blotches indicate yet another variation. Watch as this specimen pulls in his head and offers up his tail in a defensive posture. We caught all the highlighted specimens either in Toad Pond or in the slough that encircles the area. I spotted a Milanistic garter on the edge of the slough as well, but it eluded capture. Why does so much variability exist in such a limited range? In much of the literature, the variability in this species is tied to a particular geographic region. Perhaps MPG Ranch has several converging populations. As stated previously, intermountain wandering garters can engage in a lengthy yearly migration. The northern floodplain lies in close proximity to Squaw Creek and the West Fork of Lolo Creek when taken in conjunction with populations that could migrate down from the Clark Fork and up the Bitterroot. The variability at Toad Pond may represent a diversity of genetics from across western Montana. Multiple paternity may facilitate litter variants in the northern floodplain. Darker specimens could derive from a melanistic parent. Perhaps DNA tests in 2014 will help shed light on this mystery. Ultimately, the diversity of wandering garter variants at Toad Pond and the network of sloughs that feed it speaks to the structural integrity of this wetland habitat. If multiple variants can find refuge in such a limited geographic area, then that area necessarily provides sufficient cover and food sources to support a rich web of life. I want to briefly touch upon a variation I saw across the river as well. I managed to catch two snakes across the river from the northern floodplain. Both of these wandering garters have pronounced white dashes between the black blotches. 
Specimens at Toad Pond and in the slough also have white dashes, but the dashes on these two specimens are more numerous and distinct. They create a reflective sheen on the front half of the body that is broken up by the black blotches. Perhaps a reflective pattern helps confuse prey as the snake approaches. I will now discuss three wandering garters observed in Davis Creek. The first two specimens highlight yet another variant. The second and third specimens allow me to shift the focus of the video to foraging behaviors and diet. Notice that the colors on this specimen differ from those found among the floodplain varieties. The stripes appear light gray. The ventral scales are tinged darker. The charcoal blotches and head provide contrast. The darker gray background color blends them. The preponderance of gray in the Davis Creek population may speak to a specific mountain stream ecotype. I observed this second specimen substrate crawling. In order to maintain forward motion on the bottom of the stream bed, this foraging behavior requires that the snake obtain negative buoyancy. The specimen slinked its way upstream on the rocks of Davis Creek, searching for tailed frog egg masses, tadpoles, and trout fry. This large female wandering garter hunts just upstream from the trout pond in Davis Creek. She forages in the anterior dive position. I assume that she lifts her head above the water to assess my presence. Interior diving requires that the back half of her body remains above water and out of the creek, where she anchors herself by gripping a root system under the bank. The front half of her body can then strike underwater. She can maintain her body position for hours waiting for a trout to swim by. Garter snakes can remain underwater without taking a breath for up to 20 minutes, although 12 minutes constitutes an average dive. Watch as she pulls the front half of her body back to hide beneath the bank. This magnificent 29 inch specimen may well be the matriarch of Davis Creek. Given the rich food source the trout pond provides, she can stay here indefinitely. She pops her caudal gland during her attempt to ward me off. This scent gland typically remains internal during a predation encounter. The gland secretes internally while the snake voids a cloacal secretion. The musky scent elicits an unappetizing reaction. In this case, I may have startled her when I reached below the bank. The gland will retract when she feels safe. Her median stripe is initially a dull yellow. Like the other snakes caught at Davis Creek, her background color is dark gray and her ventral scales are light gray. I came upon this scene at 2 a.m. An adult garter swallowing a small trout. Irrespective of foraging method, adult wandering garters are adept at striking the head of fish. After latching onto the head, the snake dragged the fish out of the water in order to breathe easier while initiating the swallowing process. The top of the wandering garter's mouth contains an interdependent network of jaw bones. In these upper jaws, maxillary and palatine bones bear four sets of teeth that enable snakes to shift prey into the digestive tract. These teeth-bearing jaw bones can shift outward and forward, so the snake can increase the circumference of the mouth to help swallow large prey items. On the bottom of the mouth, separate lower jaws remain connected by an elastic ligament. This elasticity enables the bottom of the mouth to open wider. Snakes remain vulnerable during the swallowing process. In order to maintain control of food and avoid predation, snakes drag prey items away when disturbed. This wandering garter has bands of black scales similar to the juvenile at Toad Pond. 
The banded appearance along the length of the body helps break up the visual length of the snake. The reflecting light makes the white scales more pronounced. Diamond-shaped groupings of white scales break up the black bands. The snake appears iridescent as a result. The white scales that run the length of the median line stand out, creating a broken, yet pronounced line when reflecting light. When the maxillary and palatine jawbones lift up, this causes teeth retraction. The snake can then reposition the teeth to help shift the prey animal down the throat. Snakes can work one side of the jaw and then the other by retracting and expanding muscles down the sides of their bodies. At 4.30 a.m., when approaching the hot spot on the edge of the clubhouse pond, I heard a frog cry out in the darkness. The ensuing scene turned out to be one of the highlights of my season. The largest wandering garter observed at MPG Ranch, upwards of 36 inches, swallowing an adult bullfrog. The bullfrog's head was nearly twice as wide as the snake's head. The bullfrog's jaw appeared two inches wide. Typically, the invasive bullfrog eats our young garter snakes. For me, this scene reasserts the prototypical predator-prey relationship. In Montana, we lack large water snake species that keep bullfrogs in check east of the Continental Divide. This massive wandering garter is fulfilling a crucial occupation in the clubhouse floodplain. The snake attacked the frog head first. When foraging, she most likely positioned herself to lunge upwards from underwater, striking the distracted bullfrog when it focused on territorial maintenance. Alternatively, she may have located the frog when it hid underneath the water. At this point, the frog is still alive. The snake is trying to subdue it to begin the swallowing process. So doing and swallowing can take hours. Here the snake attempts to reposition itself in the grass to evade my camera. In this shot, a leafhopper moves into dangerous territory. The insect's movement may have triggered the snake to bite again in a further attempt to subdue the bullfrog. The majority of garter teeth resemble hooks designed to hold onto a flopping fish or squirmy amphibian. Once implanted, they prove difficult to escape from. Garter snakes may initiate constriction, but they do not excel at the practice, so they developed other strategies for disabling prey. Large adult wandering garters possess a duvernois gland, which enables them to secrete a poison over relatively large grooved posterior teeth. These rear fangs have a gap separating them from other teeth in their respective rows, enabling the snake to dig them into the muscles of large prey. A duct from the gland transfers the poison over these teeth. The grooves help the poison travel up the teeth via capillary action. In addition, a furrow between the lips and teeth transfers the poison around the mouth. The poison secreted in the mouths of wandering garters does not impair the neurological systems of prey. Rather, the poison is a hematoxin that initiates necrosis with localized hematoma, edema, and bleeding. Studies indicate that this poison facilitates pulmonary hemorrhaging in mice. In addition, the secreted poison causes myonecrosis, the breakdown of muscle tissue. In the case of this bullfrog, Myonecrosis can help break up the pectoral muscles so the pectoral girdle can partially collapse to facilitate swallowing. The bullfrog muscles and connected tissue will simultaneously begin to dissolve while being squeezed further down the snake's digestive tract. The poison also lubricates the prey to help mitigate friction.
Ultimately, wandering garters prove indispensable to the wetlands of MPG Ranch. As generalists, they can curb a variety of prey populations, preserving balance across a wide range of habitat.